Well, hello to all. This is Dr. Gary Huber, and I am here with an absolute rock star, a stud, a man that has climbed Mount Everest. Well, not exactly, but nearly so. This is Paul Cato. Uh, he's become a very dear friend. And uh, full disclosure, if you know Chelsea Dorsett, and if you know me, you probably know Chelsea. This is Chelsea's dad. And Paul got some news in early 2021 that he had pancreatic cancer, not just pancreatic cancer, stage four. And if you know anything about pancreatic cancer, that is a very dark day. That is not filled with bright optimism. Uh, the prognosis is very bleak. And we're going to talk about what pancreatic cancer is. And I want to say right up front, Paul is sitting before us right now, cancer free to the best of our knowledge. So uh, when you talk about cancer, people squirm in their seat. It's an uncomfortable topic. But we're here because Paul has an incredible story, incredible journey. And I want him to share it with you because he's a light for a lot of people. And he's taken his journey and, and done an, uh, some amazing things with it. He's created uh, a little charitable foundation that is helping other cancer patients. So I can't wait to get into all that. Um, before we let Paul take over the show, which is what I want. I just want to share what is pancreatic cancer? I want you going into this knowing what is pancreatic cancer? Well, the pancreas is part of our digestive system. The problem with pancreatic cancer, there's not screening tests for this. In fact, we only have screening tests for five different cancers, right? The ones you're familiar with, breast cancer and prostate and lung, uh, colon. But we don't have a screening test for pancreatic cancer. So by the time you have it, you've had it for a while and it's very aggressive and that's what makes the prognosis so bleak only two to nine percent that's a very low number two to nine percent of people that are diagnosed with pancreatic cancer are going to su are survive beyond five years um, a small 20 percent of those with pancreatic cancer if they can get the surgery it's very helpful but only 20 percent are even eligible for surgery because the disease, if it's spread to other organs, it makes them ineligible. And that was the case with Paul. And even if you're in that small group of 20% that your cancer is resectable by surgery, your survival after that is even only 27%, five-year survival. If you have metastatic disease where it's left the pancreas and it's gone elsewhere, as it did in Paul, the survivability is two to six months Okay, these are not happy numbers. And here we sit um, a year from the onset of symptoms for Paul. So you've already beat the odds dramatically, but I want to get into your story. And uh, tell me how this all started. This is January of, of 2021. And Paul, take it away. Okay. Um, so yeah, just about a year ago, as you said, I, um, January 2021, I started having some digestive issues, uh, both upper GI and lower GI. Um, initially diagnosed as perhaps acid reflux or gastritis. Um, but, you know, over the course of a few weeks, things weren't getting any better. Um, so it was, it was suggested just to eliminate any, any big issues or, or verify that there was nothing more critical going on. It was recommended that I had a upper and lower GI series. And it was during the lower GI series that um, uh, they identified a, a blockage, uh, something pressing, lesion pressing against my colon, and it you know, presented itself as their inability to complete uh, the colonoscopy. So with that, uh, I, uh, I had a CAT scan a few hours after the colonoscopy. And later that day, I received the news that um, the CAT scan revealed that there was a, a tumor in my pancreas, uh, there was areas of, of cancer outside the pancreas. There was presence of ascites in that area, um, and that's that's really where the, uh, the the journey began. And going into this, you were a healthy guy. You are a healthy guy. You're lean. You're active. You didn't have diabetes. You didn't have a lot of other medical issues. On no medication, no history of pancreatitis. So this really came as uh, as quite the shock. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, you know, maybe a few pounds overweight, but, you know, always been active, always work out, always, you know, bike, combination of aerobic exercise and, and resistance exercise. So, you know, in my view, and, and I think a few of, you know, a lot of others, I was a reasonably healthy guy, never, never on any medication at all. And this is, this is how, unfortunately, a lot of people get their, their news if they have cancer, right? They have a little bit of symptom, they get a test and voila, there it is. And I think it leads a lot of people 
to go through their life saying, gosh, I hope I don't get it. I, I hope cancer doesn't just swoop in and magically, you know, take me over. And that really isn't how it works. Um, typically for most of us, and your case is very unusual, because like you said, very lean, very active, not diabetic, reasonably good diet. Chelsea has seen to that over the years, I'm sure. Um, but it's the, and this is really what I want to take away from this experience for a lot of people that do what you need to do now. Don't wait, you know, until a bad diagnosis. Control your sugar, control your health, control your weight, because this really dramatically reduces overall risk. So it was a double whammy for you. We didn't really see a lot of risk upcoming. They get the scan. There's a tumor about the size one and a half by one inches in size of the pancreas. But making it more problematic, it seemingly had spread to a couple of areas of the colon, uh, the diaphragm. And so that increases the complexity of your case. And because of that metastatic spread, they said, Paul, you're not a surgical candidate. Tell me, I think the mental construct here is really important. That's, that's a hell of a piece of news to get on any given day. Walk me through what happened over the next days and weeks and mentally and what you were thinking. So, you know, the, the, as the diagnosis was presented, it was, you know, it's um, not curable, except if we can get you into surgery. So I kind of, kind of hung on, on that. And, um, you know, the, the plan going forward was intense um, chemotherapy, um, which I started almost immediately after diagnosis, which within, within a week or a week and a half. Uh, and I went through a series of eight cycles uh, treatment every other week uh, for a total of three days uh, during every other week. And, um, you know, as, as we progressed, I, I, started, I started feeling better, right? So I'm dealing with two things. I'm dealing with the effects of the chemo, also dealing with the debilitating effects of the disease, because I think, as I mentioned, I had I'd gone from, you know, full speed to like 30% overnight. I'd lost a dramatic amount of weight uh, in no time. Yeah. Uh, so we started the chemo, uh, we started, uh, started feeling better. And I, as I said, I had a total of eight, eight treatments, uh, which got me, um, to a point at the end of June where scans revealed that, uh, the cancer that had spread beyond the pancreas had now been all contained in the only let's, identified. Let's back that story up just a little bit, because this, I think is the beauty of your story. Even before you started the chemotherapy, you and I met, we sat down and talked about, all right, this is a bad diagnosis, obviously coming to you as a, as a friend or our connection through Chelsea and saying, we gotta get aggressive here. We gotta take this on. And we had started integrative therapy even before you started chemo. There is a marker, a tumor marker, that is not a great screening test, but for those that have pancreatic cancer, a CA-19 blood test can give us some relative idea of how aggressive this cancer is. And your number was really high. It was 434 when it was first tested. We had started a number of integrative therapies. Now, integrative medicine, what is that doing in the, in the face of, of cancer? We're trying to support the upcoming chemo. We're gonna protect the body against the negative effects of chemo. We're gonna try to weaken the cancer with some elements, uh, mushroom extracts and things like Metatrol Pro. We're going to literally make it harder for the cancer to feed itself by limiting its ability to take in glucose. We're going to support detox. So we're going to go through this nine-step process of what can we do to make your body very hostile ground for cancer. And what was really exciting to me is even before you started chemotherapy, we'd been doing this integrative approach for two weeks, and we saw a drop in your CA-19 from 434 down to, I believe it was 167. Do I have right. that right? Yes. That's, a, that's more than a 60% drop even before we started chemo. So that had to be very, uh, very encouraging at that point. Oh, yeah, ab absolutely. And uh, um, a, a subsequent scan prior to the initiation of chemo also showed reduction in the original tumor size as well. So, so the numbers went down and there was a reduction in the initial tumor size from the earlier scan to, to the scan just before chemo. So those were very encouraging. I think uh, that's the important point that I want people to take away from our discussion is you started to engage in a 
in a very different, you, you took on everything that we asked you to do. You changed your diet, you reduced carbohydrates, uh, you were already an exerciser, but we were sitting in your living room and I, I made a comment to you that cancer hates oxygen. And you took that to heart in a big way. Tell, tell everybody what you did. Yeah, so, so I, 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 I listened to that and, and I felt, well, you know, we're throwing all of this external um, activity at the cancer, but what can I do internally? And when you tell me cancer hates oxygen, you know, it's like, well, I can exercise. And, and I started thinking about how I was gonna do that. So I began very slowly on an indoor bike um, you know, you know, riding 10, 15 minutes, whatever I, I could, I could muster up. Uh, and then as I progressed, and I think it would be, it was like after chemo treatment two, I started, I got out on, on the road bike. And, uh, when I first, my first ride, I could not lift my bike off the rack and into my truck. I had to have my son help me get the bike off the wall into the truck. And I think that initial ride might've been 10 miles or less at a very slow pace. And then Every day after that, I kept on riding and I kept on riding and I started feeling stronger and better. Um, and, you know, between chemo, I got to a point between chemo treatments, I was riding 150, 160, 170 miles uh, between chemo treatments. Which are two uh, weeks and, apart. So you're, you're logging, you're starting to log close to hundred miles a week. Yes. <laughs> and, and, and that's with, you know, take, take out three, Three days, three days for the chemo. chemo and, yeah. Um, but I was blessed that there were minimal side effects from the chemo that enabled me to do that. And I feel in part, and you know, mentally I feel my exercise helped mitigate those side effects. Yeah. You know, there's an interdependency there. I firmly believe there's an interdependency there. Um, and I got stronger and I got faster. And I got to the point where, you know, I was riding almost as fast as I rode a year ago before before I got before I got sick. So you know, between my second chemo treatment and when I ultimately um, got into surgery, I rode you know a total of fifteen hundred miles. Um, <laughs> because I, I told my oncologist, "You get me to surgery, I'm going to be ready." And uh, and speak to that because you've shared this with me before. This idea that you'd be on your bike, and and you and I both like to cycle for similar reasons. It's that quiet time. There's just the wind in your ears, and there's nobody yapping at you, and it's almost meditative, isn't it? In the in the flow of the cycling, but you use that time to mentally tell yourself that, go ahead, tell what was going through your mind as you spent those miles on the bike. It was, you know, I, I always had positive thoughts. It was, I'm doing this. I, I could visualize, you know, flooding those cancer cells with oxygen. Um, and it was, it was meditation on wheels, right? Because yeah. when we talk about meditation, it's typically <laughs> laying down in a calm place. But this was yeah. meditation on wheels. Yeah. Um, and there was, one, there was one kind of a transitional point where, I mean, I, I went out for a ride. I got, you know, I got, I guess, probably 12, 15 miles away from home. And the skies opened up. Thunder, lightning, rain. <laughs> um, Welcome and, to cycling. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, of course, my wife, who's tracking me on my phone, wants to send in the troops. She's calling my son to come, you know, pick up the truck, find me. And I, and I said, no. And, and that, that was kind of a transition point as I rode through that storm mm -hmm. and I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to stop. I wasn't going to, you know, go hide under a, a park bench shelter. Yeah. I just rode all the way back through that storm. And that, that, that was a pivotal point for me um, mm -hmm. in this, in this journey. And it's, wow. uh, I had not heard that story from you before. But it speaks to this, this is a mental battle, right? Because we can give in and we can say, oh, you know, I've got stage four pancreatic cancer. Okay, well, let's get my affairs in order. It speaks to the fact that you attacked it. It wasn't attacking you, you were attacking it right back. And not just on the bike, you know, it's the whole mental aspect. And, and just to people that are watching this, if I asked Paul to do anything, all right, game on, okay. Grounding, no problem. Pemph mat, no problem. Meditation, you got it. It speaks to the mentality behind this. And I want to open the door right now for you to speak to that aspect because there are people, well intended, but maybe not thinking it through, that will say things to you in a very negative fashion or will treat you in a way 
that they introduce negativity into this mindset. How did you deal with that? So, yeah, I mean, that was perhaps one of the hardest, hardest things because, you know, myself, my family, my doctors, my whole support group is very positive, but every once in a while, people are going to say things that, you know, I don't believe they mean to be harmful, but they, they end up being hurtful, you know, I mean, hey, well, let's write your obituary. I mean, whoa, where did that come from? Um, <laughs> literally, you know, let's, let's, yeah. let's, let's put it on tape. Um, you know, oh, you know, you, you, your wife will be set, you know, things, things like that. Um, and I found those incredibly hurtful and, and, you know, I'll be honest with you. They, they knocked me off my, my game for a little bit and, you know, but mm -hmm. you know, you played a big part in helping me kind of rationalize that my, 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 my wife, my friends. So what I was able to do was to switch that around that negative energy and turn it into positive energy. You know, so, okay, we'll write my obituary when I'm 75, not when I'm 63, you know, and, and those are the kind of switches uh, that I use to, to motivate me uh, when people would say the, the kind of negative things. Well, there's a lot of reason to have doubt, right? If we just look at statistics, and I think that's one of the clear things that comes through with, with your situation. You're not a statistic, you're an individual. And I've known a lot of people like you that said, I refuse to be a statistic. I'm going to have my own outcome. I'm going to determine my outcome. And you're kind of speaking to that right now. People will say, well, based on the diagnoses, you know, we should write your obituary. And it can create doubt. And it can make you think, well, wait a minute, am I delusional? Am I telling myself this happy story that I'm going to beat this thing and it's not realistic? It, it really, it's a gut check. I think all of us experience something like it in life, not to the same extreme as what you experienced. Um, one of the things that I had shared with you was a book called Radical Remission by Kelly Turner. It came out of a, a, a video that Chelsea and I watched called Heal. And I recommend this to all my patients, this, this book. Tell me what, what that book meant to you. Because, and just for those of you that have never heard of it, Kelly Turner interviewed hundreds of stage four cancer patients that had a really bad outcome, very bad prognosis, and they're telling their stories 10 years later. And they shouldn't be. They, right? They should all be in the ground. And so the question is, how are these people different? You're, you're unique and you're wonderful, but you, there are hundreds and hundreds of people like you that did a similar thing. They said, no, that, that end is not good enough. I'm going to make a difference. So in Kelly Turner's book, she highlights nine different things that people that had a radical remission, a radical mission defined as you dramatically beat the odds. And only two of those things were physical. Change your diet. Yes right? And take some supplementation. And we did a good deal of that. But there are seven other points that speak to the mental aspect, your faith, your intuitive sense, your speak to what the book brought to you in that regard. So I think the biggest thing is that it brought a toolbox, right? So there's not just one simple closed form solution. And it gave me hope and encouragement that, you know, there's diet, there's supplementation, uh, there's meditation, um, you know, all in conjunction with, you know, with traditional treatments. Right. And, yeah. uh, so it, it gave me, it gave me hope, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say, you know, that I was like, okay, this is a hundred percent, you know, this is the outcome we're going to have, but, but unless you believe that this is the outcome you're going to have, you're not going to get it. Right. You, you know, so, it has so it's a possibility. Yes. Yeah. And, and so you swing, you swing for the fence um, and, and don't think about the negative aspects of this. So the, so the book showed me the, the art of the possible, what, what could be done in yeah. doing these things in conjunction. And, you know, I realized, you know, not, not everybody, you know, I, I feel very blessed and very fortunate. Um, but this gave me a, the, the structure to try in the, in the structure to move forward. Yeah. I, I think your story is not just for cancer patients. The story of I will determine my outcome applies to any 20 year old who's just trying to figure out what their life's about or anybody in midlife who's trying to figure out how do I balance my life and my family and my career. It's creating the narrative of this is what I'm going to do rather than saying, I wonder what the world's going to do to me. 
you know, and, and that's, that's part of what you opened up that, that beautiful mindset that just said, I'm going to, I'm going to take control of this. We had a beautiful symphony of players in this. You had a, a wonderful oncologist who, if, if you understand integrative medicine, integrative medicine says, yes, traditional modalities are a great tool but let's add to that. Let's add lifestyle and diet and exercise and all these modalities. And when we merge those things together, we have best possibility. And in your case, we had a, we had a great marriage between your oncologist, our efforts, your dietary efforts. Um, your lab numbers went from 434 to 167. You put yourself in a position to become a surgical candidate because everything began to shrink. And they went back and did a scan at one point and they said, oh my gosh, we don't even see the colon lesions anymore on your scan. And your tumor has shrunk. And voila, Paul is now a surgical candidate. So tell, tell everybody about that stage of the process. So um, that unfolded in the end of June after eight rounds of, of therapy in conjunction with hundreds of miles on the bike and, and all of the other, you know, the, the, the faith, the prayers, uh, you know, and I, you know, we had people all over the world praying for me, literally all over the world. Um, and so we got to the end of June and we, we had a series of scans and the surgeon said, well, this is, this is optimistic. This looks good. This is encouraging. And um, so at that point, uh, I became a candidate for surgery and, you know, recognizing that even at that point, the surgery wasn't a slam dunk, which was the, the, your, the, the term my, my, my surgeon used, because it's not a slam dunk. Um, you know, we have to get in there and validate the CAT scan and make sure that the areas that we think have gone away are, are indeed gone. So uh, it was billed as exploratory uh, when, we, when we started the surgery. Um, and you know, the surgery took place at the end of August. Um, they went in, they did a series of 14 biopsies to the peripheral areas and, and validated that, yes, the, there was no cancer present, and then proceeded with um, the surgery to remove, remove the, the tumor. That, you know, people can listen to this and go, oh, well, the chemotherapy killed all the cancer. But we have to remember the odds. Chemotherapy doesn't traditionally and consistently and reliably kill cancer in pancreatic cancer cases. I think it's a combination. And that's where I think your story is, is just fantastic because you did take the chemo that goes in and weakens or affects or kills some of the cancer, but your immune system, the fact that you weren't feeding the cancer, the fact that you were throwing oxygen and meditation and everything else at it, that's the com combination I think that was magically you and Chelsea and your wife and your family and a large community of people with fingers crossed were hoping that as you went back in for that scan that we wouldn't see any more because if it had spread to the colon and stayed there, you wouldn't have been a surgical candidate, but you were and they biopsied and when the surgeon went in and took the cancer out, it came out cleanly and easily and your CA-19, which has started in the 400s and then was 160, it dropped down after surgery to a five. And then on two subsequent checks since then, it's been a four and a four. Now I'll remind you, not, not you, but people watching, the CA-19 should be less than 37. You're a four, okay? <laughs> it's gone, the cancer is gone, the scans are clean. Can this come back? Yeah, that's, that's what we're going to be cautious about. And that's why currently you're doing a little follow-up chemo to ensure. But the difference, and I want people to understand this, what keeps cancer from coming back is your immune system being strong and killing it. We all have cancer cells, every single one of us. Why don't we all have oncologists? Because our immune system is killing it. And what I want people to take away from this discussion that you and I are sharing is not just your miraculous story. On a day-to-day -day basis, I get to ask myself, do I wanna feed my cancer cells or do I wish to starve them and kill them, right? When we eat a high sugar diet, a high carb diet, we're going to feed cancer cells. We're gonna roll closer toward type two diabetes. When we eat a really great diet and we take in foods like vegetables, vegetables literally have compounds in them that are capable of helping your liver detoxify and are capable of killing cancer cells. Your immune system kills cancer cells. And that's where you are right now. And I think 
if I was in Vegas laying odds on whether you ever get recurrence, I'm going to put a big chunk of change on no way. You've, you understand your physiology. And I think the odds of this coming back are exceedingly slim. And I think you're going to continue to defy those odds just because of who you are as a person, you know, your commitment to your health, your commitment to your family. And I want people to come away from this knowing that they do have control, right? We are not just at the mercy of our genetics. We're not at the mercy um, of, of unseen forces. So anyway, um, so tell me, uh, tell me a little bit about that, the mindset. Um, there, you know, is there anything else you want to share about kind of where your thought process is now? So I think, I think one important thing is to mention is that, you know, when you, when you get a diagnosis like this, obviously we've stated it's overwhelming and it's devastated. Um, but it's important to break it down, break the path down into manageable chunks. Yeah. So for example, when, you know, I was told, you know, surgery is the path to a cure. I focused on getting to surgery and my, 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 my vision was my wife driving me home from the hospital after a successful surgery. That was my road stop. Right. And that everything I did was focused on visualizing that day. Um, and, and, you know, I didn't, I didn't look two years ahead, three years ahead, four years ahead. I just looked, okay, what do we need to do to get me into surgery? I'm going to be ready for it. And I visualized, you know, all the time to countless miles that ride home. Yeah. And then now what do we do? Well, we have follow-up treatments. So I'm, I'm visualizing you know, getting through the follow-up treatments and, 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 you know, hope, you know, we're doing good on the numbers, the CA-19 numbers, you know, the, the next hurdle is a, is a scan in January. But I think the message I want to deliver is that if you try to solve the whole problem at once, you, you can easily get overwhelmed. So breaking it down into subsets with measurable metrics was, was, was important for me and was a key, key for me. And there's, there's two very important concepts in that. The idea of visualization, actually seeing my desired outcome. I, I speak a lot of that when I talk about mission statements. I want people to see their destination. And you that's exactly what you were doing. You were picturing it in your head. That is powerful. There are multiple studies showing the body can't tell the difference between something vividly imagined and the actual event. Well, that can work for us or against us. If I consistently imagine bad things and what ifs and the negativity of life and I focus on that and I'm a worrier, I can drive bad outcomes within my body. You took it to the other direction. I'm going to visualize really great things. And your body will actually respond to that. And you did that. The other thing was you, you spoke beautifully about breaking it down into smaller pieces. Right? Let's take this outside the realm of cancer. Let's say I'm an overweight diabetic with high blood pressure. I can't fix that in one week, but if I chunk it down into smaller pieces, I'm gonna change my diet and now I'm gonna start to exercise and now I'm going to work on the, the blood sugar control piece. Just like you reverse engineered, because you're an engineer, you reverse engineered your outcome. You can reverse engineer anything in your health history. So I think that's a beautiful story for, for anybody to kind of take take away. All right, my good man. Uh, any other great pearls of wisdom you want to share before we put a wrap on this? No, I, you know, I, I want to thank you personally. Um, I, I had a combination of, you know, yourself, my surgeon, my oncologist working together as a, as a team uh, in a complimentary fashion. Um, and obviously, I'll give a shout out to Chelsea. My daughter, who, who uh, you know, brought me anything and everything she could to the table as far as uh, uh, you know, getting me back on track from a, a diet perspective. Because you know, when this all started, it wasn't a matter of eating good foods or bad foods. I I could barely eat, and you know, we had to get the train back on the tracks. That's step one before we could start start getting getting to a cure. So. Um, it takes a village and I had a village 
and I'm, I'm so thankful and, you know, a world full of prayers and it's gotten me to where I am. There is no bigger cheerleader on this planet than your daughter, Chelsea. And I've seen her Correct. do that with all of our patients. Uh, she's an amazing force. She really is. You look at this cute little package and behind that cute little package is an amazing energy that's powerful. Um, she's, she's just a great cheerleader. She's a supporter. She's a driver. She's amazing in that regard. You pointed to the team effect. We had a beautiful combination um, of your oncologist and our efforts and everybody working together. And that's how every cancer patient should be treated, bringing all the parts of the puzzle together and, and without friction, without ego, right? With just ease of, we all have our roles to play. And it worked out beautifully in your case. So yes, shout out to uh, your team and your oncologist, your surgeon, Chelsea, and of course, all the great people in your life that made it happen. Paul, thank you so much. I appreciate you taking the time to go through this. I guarantee you, people are going to take strength and direction from your story. I think it's powerful. And I think it goes beyond cancer. It goes to the human spirit and what's possible if we believe in ourselves and you know, accept, accept the love that's around us and let that infuse us with possibility, then I think anything is possible. So thank you so much, my good man. I greatly appreciate your time. Thank you. All right. Take care. All right.